listeners, and welcome to the Monto Weekly Podcast, bringing you energy matters in an informal setting. In today's pod, we discuss the potential vulnerability of Europe's energy infrastructure, especially offshore pipelines and electricity interconnections. Concerns were raised following an incident at the Baltic connector linking Finland with Estonia. While supply of gas to both countries is unlikely to be impacted given the availability of LNG shipments, at least in the short to medium term, the, the incident has potentially exposed both countries to winter shortages. And in addition, it poses questions over the security of the wider subsea infrastructure in the Baltic, but also in the North Sea. How at risk are there physical or cyber attacks? Joining me, Richard Sverson, is Jakob Gosimirski of the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. A warm welcome to you, Jakob. Hello. Um, just when we thought we could perhaps begin to relax ahead of the winter, the Baltic Connector incident in the Baltic Sea has made many people nervous. Should they be worried, Jakob? Uh, we should wait until uh, it is uh, calm, uh, the investigation is completed and some uh, the conclusions uh, could be drawn. Uh, we don't uh, know exactly what happened. We know that uh, some elements of uh, critical infrastructures infrastructure were damaged. Uh, we don't know who was uh, behind and we don't know what uh, the long-term uh, impact of this is going to be. But we know that uh, this raises a number of uh, issues uh, more broadly. The issue of the exposure of uh, pretty various elements of critical infrastructure to uh, man-made operations that could inflict some uh, physical but also digital uh, damage to those uh, uh, to those uh, objects and uh, structures is definitely back uh, on the agenda. And this is not uh, uh, a coincidence because we need to remember that only 13 months ago something happened in the other part of the Baltic Sea where uh, where the two where the two uh, uh, Nord Stream pipelines were uh, uh, damaged, and uh, and uh, this uh, has made uh, many worry about uh, the fate of uh, critical infrastructure in this uh, time of uh, growing uh, pen- tensions between Russia and the collective West. And we know that uh, Russia uh, used to be one of the key uh, suppliers of energy to Europe, so Russia could have some incentives to. Uh, change the, the balance of energy power also by conducting this type of operations. And we know also that uh, when we think about this type of uh, issues, we need to think about uh, uh, in whose interest something could be done, but also what kind of uh, purely technical capabilities uh, uh, those who could be interested in inflicting damage uh, can have. And we know that Russia has maybe bought the interest and the intention, but also the technical capacity, possibility to inflict this type of damage. So this this is a part of the broader discussion about the security situation in the Europe in the aftermath of this war in Ukraine. Absolutely, and um, I know you said you know it's early days. Um, it's probably too too early to apportion blame or, or point the finger anywhere. But I mean, could. Is it likely that such an incident could have been the result of, of for example, a ship's anchor as as equally as, as a sabotage? I have been following this discussion and uh, uh, there have been two uh, mentions of two different uh, ships that could be somehow involved in uh, uh, causing this uh, trouble. We know that, uh, that there have been some accusation, accusations raised against one, uh, the suspicion raised against one of the Russian ships that was uh, uh, observed in the uh, vicinity of the place where this damage occurred, but there is also some information about another, uh, this time, Chinese ship that could also be involved. But uh, it's very difficult to somehow point uh, what could be the uh, reason for this damage to be done, because as far as I understand, uh, uh, this uh, pipeline, the, the place where the damage was done, is like 60 meters uh, below the uh, sea uh, surface, uh, then uh, it's n- not uh, possible that, uh, for instance, some uh, uh, poor uh, maneuvering of a ship could uh, have uh, uh, damaged this uh, uh, this uh, the, this infrastructure. So, but uh, we, 
until we don't know, since we don't know what has really happened, then it's really too early to draw any uh, conclusions. Yeah. Do you know when we could find out at the earliest? I mean, we still we're still waiting for answers in, in terms of the North Stream pipeline uh, explosions. So we could be waiting for quite a while. I think that what is important here to understand is that uh, it's not necessarily the, the result of the investigation that is going to be important. We know that something uh, that is difficult to explain uh, has happened. Uh, this something has had some impact on the av availability of uh, energy in two countries. Uh, and uh, having in mind that uh, similar um, uh, accidents or uh, things happened before, then it raises a number of questions and makes the people uh, uh, worry about uh, for instance, the coming uh, winter, it's uh, it, it has had a direct impact on two countries that uh, more or less are able to cover their immediate energy needs from other sources. But uh, this is also a part of this uh, broader uh, picture and discussion about the need to, to protect the critical infrastructure, not only in the Baltic Sea, but also in other places where this uh, critical infrastructure plays even uh, a much more uh, crucial role in uh, securing energy supply uh, to consumers in Europe, but also in other parts of uh, the world. So, I mean, if if you know, if I were a, a Norwegian pipeline operator or, or a gas firm, should I be worried about this incident in the Baltic? I mean, if it can happen there, could it not happen in the North Sea? And and you know, and, and far more important. I mean, not to denigrate the, the the border connector in any way, but you know, the the amount of flows that go from Norway to continental Europe and to the UK are vastly um, vastly more in, more in terms of size and volume than than what is flowing in the Baltic connector. So should you know, is this raising? You know, serious concerns about other parts of the energy infrastructure and other parts of of uh, of Europe. It definitely does, and uh, there are several good reasons why it uh, does and why it should uh, make people uh, worry, or at least uh, make should make people take some uh, uh, precautions. Uh, the first the issue is the question of the exposure of uh, those who need uh, this energy to this uh, possible uh, damage. The other the question is that uh, it's uh, relatively easy to monitor a small uh, pipeline collecting to uh, relatively peripheral countries in Europe, while uh, you face a uh, much uh, bigger uh, challenge if you are to monitor uh, 8,000 kilometers of the Norwegian uh, pipeline system connecting uh, the production uh, fields with uh, customers in the Europe. And then there is also another dimension here because uh, we think uh, about infrastructure as uh, something that uh, is made up of uh, several types of physical objects but we also know that uh, the supply of gas and other uh, resources could also be influenced by uh, conducting an, an operation in a digital space because we know that in order to manage this whole flow of, uh, let's say, Norwegian gas uh, from those several uh, tens of uh, production fields to various uh, uh, parts of uh, critical infrastructure to Europe uh, needs to be managed uh, somehow. And this management is not uh, being done manually, but uh, digitally. So if you get access to uh, the digital systems that um, uh, help uh, Gasco, which is the Norwegian company that is uh, uh, responsible for management of those uh, gas flows to Europe. If you are able to get access to the, uh, the cyber systems, then you can inflict even a bigger uh, uh, damage to the supply of uh, gas from Norway to Europe than by blowing up uh, one or uh, two uh, pipes. So, so this is also an important dimension here to have in mind. So it, it's 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 virtual as well as physical. The, the threat here. Of of course, I can mention, for instance, that um, in uh, on the first of January two thousand and nineteen, Norway introduced a new law on security, and uh, there were three main reasons why this law was this new law was introduced. One was that uh, there uh, had been some uh, important changes in the strategic environment of Norway. Uh, Russian intervention in Ukraine in 2014 was the best example of those changes. Then uh, there was uh, something that was called 
digital uh, technological change uh, because uh, over the past uh, decades, uh, more and more elements of uh, critical infrastructure have also been digital, digi digitalized, meaning that they are more exposed not only to physical attacks, but also to the, the operations in the cyberspace. And then the, the third reason why this new law was introduced was that uh, that there was the kind of realization that Norway needs a system where you can have a kind of um, uh, complete overlook of the situation and to make uh, those institutions that are responsible for securing access to various types of uh, uh, functions and services uh, work much more closer together because the Norwegian system, as far the, as it is concerned even today, is very much departmentalized, meaning that the Ministry of Transport is responsible for those elements of critical infrastructure that have to do with the transport. Ministry of Energy is responsible for oil and gas, but also for grids and so on and so on. So you need to have a kind of better understanding of the uh, complete uh, and more complex uh, picture of the situation. So, and this uh, this is also something that is very much applied to. Uh, in the in, uh, discussed in the Norwegian debate on uh, the issue of uh, protection of energy infrastructure, which is important not only for Norway, but also for uh, uh, several uh, hundred millions of European uh, consumers. Of course, because if, if there were to be damage either you know, physically or, or virtually to the Norwegian gas infrastructure and the flows to, that would impact the flows to Europe, you know, would have a, a huge impact, especially now ahead of the winter. Of course. And uh, this is uh, well understood, not only in Norway, but also in those uh, receiving countries. And we also see that uh, two of the most important European uh, international organizations that are more or less interested in various aspects of uh, security, but also economic activity, the European Union and NATO we have uh, established a much closer cooperation uh, in order to be better prepared to address those uh, uh, possible challenges related to the uh, various aspects of critical infrastructure. Some months ago, a special group was established where NATO and uh, the EU are going to work together. And on top of that, uh, uh, after, right after the, the blowing up of Nord Stream, uh, there was also the very much attention being paid to this at the bilateral level. Norwegian and uh, German authorities uh, uh, started a conversation and then some measures were implemented where uh, Norwegian actors uh, together with German actors were trying to somehow identify and monitor situation uh, along those uh, gas pipelines. Uh, connecting Norway with uh, Germany in this case. So, so what is the best way then to protect this infrastructure, these pipeline, these these interconnectors? Is it is it through military surveillance? What is it? Is it drones? Is it is it a combination of everything? But the, I, I think from what you're saying here, uh, Jakob, the 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 most crucially is that people work together as a region rather than individual countries. It is because when we look, for instance, at the Norwegian oil and the gas production, most of this goes to other customers. On the, between 5 and 6% of uh, gas produced in Norway is consumed uh, locally, meaning in Norway. So 94% of this gas uh, reaches uh, uh, European, mostly European consumers, and uh, it somehow uh, makes them also very much interested in uh, securing access and uh, smooth working of this uh, the critical infrastructure. So definitely international cooperation is a part of the uh, solution, but uh, you need also to uh, uh, have a balance between what you do in order to protect uh, this critical infrastructure versus what it is going to uh, cost. Because if the cost is very high, then there is maybe no point in uh, the investing this uh, uh, type of money in, uh, to protection of critical infrastructure. So this balance between uh, the need to protect, but also the need to secure a kind of um, economic viability of this whole uh, project is also important. And then um, the, the, the threats can come from various directions. I mentioned uh, the, digital sp the, the digital space. Uh, I mentioned uh, the physical uh, the possible uh, damage being done to some elements of the critical infrastructure. But an issue that is also... Uh, very much uh, discussed in Norway is this issue of, for instance, uh, 
the so-called insiders. You can have people working in your organization who could uh, be interested uh, or uh, either personally interested or forced by some external actors to provide them with some sensitive information uh, about the operations of the system, about the, the various types of security precautions being uh, taken that would make it uh, easier to external access to get access. And I know, for instance, that um, the GASCO uh, digital system was, in fact, exposed to some uh, digital attacks during the, the summer, and they have also realized that uh, they need to implement some additional measures, and uh, GASCO was also last year defined as uh, an element of critical infrastructure in Norway, and they have to go to a very uh, time-consuming and uh, difficult process of uh, uh, making people get access to the uh, confidential information, which was not uh, the requirement before. So, so this is also poses a number of challenges to those um, the institutions and organizations that uh, are defined as an element of critical infrastructure. So it's it's kind of Jakob, if I've understood you correctly, it's 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 raising the stakes in terms of industrial espionage. It definitely does. The Norwegian organizations responsible for the security of the country, PST, which is a kind of Norwegian Counter Intelligence Service, and the NMI, Norwegian Military Intelligence Service, together with the Norwegian National Security Authority, they publish official. Uh, and uh, publicly available uh, threat assessments on annual basis. And this issue of uh, uh, industrial espionage uh, uh, conducted uh, by two countries that are they identified by name, Russia and China, has been mentioned many times over the past uh, uh, five or six years. So this is definitely something that uh, uh, authorities in Norway, but also in other countries, are very much uh, uh, anxious about. Um, we've talked mainly about gas infrastructure, gas pipelines so in terms of Nord Stream and also the Baltic connector. Well, how about the power infrastructure, the power cables, the offshore wind turbines? Uh, are these also uh, vulnerable? Definitely, and uh, it's also uh, in a country like Norway where uh, more than 50% of uh, energy mix is uh, made up of uh, hydro uh, power coming from various uh, elements of uh, infrastructure in Norway. This issue of uh, protection of power grid is definitely very high on the agenda because this is what uh, makes the country uh, run in a way because without uh, power and when you look at uh, the, the Norwegian debate about um, the critical infrastructure, there are two elements of uh, critical infrastructure that are defined as uh, the most important ones in the Norwegian context. The one is namely the uh, power grid and uh, power uh, supply, and the other one is electronic uh, communication. And those two are also very strongly interconnected because without power there is no electronic uh, uh, communication in a way unless you have some alternative sources of energy easily uh, available. So power grid is definitely something that is important to um, and Norway, and uh, in the most specific terms, but also Europe, has also been uh, building a lot of uh, power interconnectors in order to make the uh, power market in Europe uh, more uh, flexible. So those are also those elements of critical infrastructure that could also be exposed because uh, when you uh, inflict some damage on some interconnectors, then you uh, make the system less uh, able to deliver it. And uh, then uh, in uh, terms of interconnectors, there is also uh, not only uh, uh, infrastructure related, but also political dimension to this uh, debate. Because uh, uh, over the past couple of uh, years, especially 2022, early 2023, Norway experienced very high uh, uh, electricity prices. And uh, uh, this was uh, by some uh, also uh, linked uh, to the fact that Norway has managed to build some uh, power interconnectors with other uh, power markets, uh, electricity markets in Europe, and uh, this uh, has supposedly made Norway more much, ex my, much more exposed to shifts in the uh, pricing of energy on the European continent. So 
uh, and this uh, has already become an important element of um, the critical infrastructure in Norway, but also uh, hotly debated uh, in the purely political and uh, uh, economic terms. So this really shows how important uh, those issues are because uh, they secure the smooth flow of energy or various types of energy, uh, gas in terms of uh, LNG and uh, piped gas, but power grids in terms of uh, making uh, this electricity available to customers. And we know that there are some examples of those power markets functioning very, very well. This Nordel experience uh, that was based on the, the cooperation among uh, the Nordic countries in uh, development and uh, uh, functioning of the power market is a very good example of this. Absolutely. I mean, who... Who benefits from the vulnerability here and 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 the the jitters of the of of the market here in terms of the infrastructure, Jakob? Is it you named, mentioned Russia and China? Um, could you know um, shipped LNG also benefit from the, the you know potential threats to to pipes and to to cables? There are many factors that somehow uh, uh, impact uh, the market uh, development in terms of energy and. Uh, we have uh, elements that are more directly connected to the critical infrastructure, but then there is also this whole the political and geopolitical uh, dimension. And uh, uh, interestingly enough, one can say that uh, one of the countries that uh, uh, may be benefited the most from those um, uncertainties and unpredictabilities uh, caused by both uh, uh, market dimension, but also by some uh, political uh, dimension, it's Norway because Norway has a uh, uh, lot of uh, extraordinary uh, revenue was generated and Norway can somehow uh, very much benefit uh, from those market developments. But this also uh, shows how uh, it is difficult to make any predictions on the market because uh, uh, during the COVID uh, period there was this understanding that uh, the energy uh, has become one of the, the key victims of uh, the pandemic because the demand for energy was much lower than uh, the prices went down. Then uh, the, the pandemic uh, ended and uh, there was this uh, uh, optimistic view of uh, the future of energy, but uh, there was also an expectation that the market would be much more balanced. Then Russia decided to launch this war against Ukraine in February, this has also had huge implications for the energy markets because uh, we had a situation when the, the most important exporter of uh, energy, Russia, was involved in the, the war with a country that uh, got also a lot of support from the most important uh, customers of uh, the, the Russia. So, so this uh, needs also to be understood that the market is influenced not only by the economy by market related uh, uh, devel developments, but also by those uh, geopolitical uh, issues. Absolutely, and, and and a final question here for you, Jakob. And 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 I, and I think while I have you here, it'd be uh, <laughs> you'd be opportune moment to ask you about the geopolitical crisis that we now see unfolding in the Middle East conflict. Sadly, um, you know, I know it's having a devastating effect on on the populations and inhabitants of the region. Um, but what kind of are you concerned that it could have very you know, big implications for? For, for, for energy, for especially for, for, for oil and gas? Definitely, we have to do with a conflict that is uh, in the middle of the Middle East, which is still an important area for production and uh, the export of uh, energy commodities. Uh, and we know that there are uh, growing tensions uh, in the region, uh, and uh, this most probably is going to have some uh, huge implications for energy markets, but it's also very much uh, it is going to very much depend on uh, how quick this uh, most tense uh, phase of the conflict is going to be uh, dealt with uh, so and what kind of uh, measures those countries that are uh, directly and indirectly involved in this uh, the conflict are going to take in order to 
column with the situation at the market as well. Yeah, it's, it's very worrying times, I think, uh, both the incidents in, in the Baltic as well as uh, in, in the Middle East. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm sadly, we can't leave on an optimistic note. But uh, Jakub, uh, thank you very much for joining the Monta Weekly Podcast. Thank you very much. Looking very much forward to next conversation. Bye-bye.